It's a cool and dewy morning in a natural paradise on an island in the very heart of Europe. The idyll is perfect, except that a voice or two may be missing from the chorus of a thousand frogs. It's a wild place and home to wild creatures. It hasn't been there for very long. The island is man-made and it's surrounded by a teeming city. This green spot in the middle of the Danube and in the middle of Vienna also attracts human crowds especially on a long weekend in June, when three million people party at Europe's biggest open-air event. Locals, this island of contrasts is simply called the Isle. In the small hours of the morning, the fun fizzles out. But the party isn't over. Far from it. Quick shadows scurry about between plastic cups and paper plates. For the stone martin mother and her cubs, and many other animals, the island overnight has turned into a land of milk and honey. These nights, the birds in the trees can relax. No martin will come for their eggs. Stone martins are opportunists and will eat just about any leftovers they run across. Hot dogs, fried chicken, kebab. But the uninvited guests have to be quick. When the sun comes up and the Metropolitan Cleaning Squad moves in, the party is definitely over. The Viennese like their island clean and tidy. The Danube Island is a rich mosaic of contrasting habitats where many species find relief from city stress. But actually, the island was created for a different purpose. To manage the seasonal floods of the Danube and to end, once and for all, the inundations that have threatened Vienna since its earliest days. For centuries, the Danube, with its many channels, meandered through a floodplain up to five kilometers wide. It protected the north side of the city. The Turks besieged Vienna from the other side, for the last time in 1683. But the river was also a threat, 
With every flood, the river's course shifted. Channels were clogged and new ones opened up. This dynamic, pristine riverscape, with its braided channels and backwaters, was home to a profusion of plants and animals. Humans were kept out by impenetrable riverine forests. Any attempts to contain the floods with dams would fail. Again and again, Vienna's lower suburbs got more than wet feet. The flood disaster of 1830 caused by an ice jam and industrialists demanding safer transportation routes for railroads and steamships resulted in a huge river regulation project that started in the spring of 1870. Ten square kilometers of riverscape were turned into a vast construction site. At the time, it was the most massive human intervention in an ecosystem in the Austrian Empire. The Danube was given a new, straightened bed. If the water level rose critically, a floodplain surrounded by a dam would serve as a safe overflow basin. But early in the 20th century, it turned out that the new channel was too narrow to safeguard Vienna against extreme floods. Although the overflow area and the dam did protect the districts beyond the Danube, the city center itself was still vulnerable. A new and more efficient flood control system was needed. But it was only built 70 years later. Finally, in 1969, the solution was clear. A second riverbed in the floodplain. The excavated material would be heaped up to form an island. In March 1972, the mayor of Vienna sinks the first pilot for this mega project. In the 16 years that followed, gigantic earth moving machinery, pontoon bridges, and giant concrete mixers dominated the scene in the middle of Vienna. A vast gravel pit was excavated. The passion for digging proved contagious. With the construction work still in full swing, sand martins began to colonize a steep artificial embankment. Their efforts paid off. The martins bank was later integrated into the landscaping and is still in use today. An important contribution to the colonization of the island was made by riverine forests upstream from Vienna. 
Walking on the water, whether God's gift or nature's, does come in handy. For those incapable of such miracles, the new bridges were inroads of invasion. This stagnant backwater was something of a seedbed for the first colonization of the Danube island. It was to be filled in, but biologists realized that it was teeming with life, and it turned out to be one of the last refuges of an almost extinct amphibian, the Danube crested newt. Newts only enter the water to reproduce, otherwise they're land animals. This rare and extremely shy species is only found here and near the Black Sea. The digging wounds have long healed. Grey herons are attracted by a wealth of fish. What grey herons appreciate here is the mosaic of contrasting biotopes. Scientists call it a biotope network. On the island's southern tip, ancient trees echo the old riverine woodland. The hydroelectric dam downstream from the island has recently been bypassed with a fish ladder. Now fish can migrate further upstream to find new spawning grounds. The old backwater from a bird's perspective, a kingfisher's and a beaver's dream. The island's centre was designed as a park with amenities for Vienna's population. On the far side of the Danube, just opposite the island, Vienna is busy building a second city centre around the United Nations headquarters. This is the north end of the biotope network, with man-made ponds, patches of ancient riverine forest, and wildflower meadows adding up to a total length of 21 kilometers. Unimpressed by the road traffic, the grey heron heads for the breeding colony. This tiny island lies right in what used to be the Danube's main channel. Its huge trees are prime real estate for at least 15 breeding pairs. First flight must be scary, and precision landing is the hardest part. The youngest ones are only just feeling their wings. No one wants to be left out. In the Viennese dialect, to heron is a verb and means to vomit. The adult birds carry their catch in their stomachs, but no matter how often their parents arrive, it's never enough. It's the starting signal for the sportive spring season. From now on, winter fat is mercilessly burned by jogging, cycling and skating. Driven by visions of sexy bodies and sweating like mules, the crowds pant past fascinating natural spectacles and take no notice.
the little bittern's body is geared to life in the reeds. In Austria, the species is endangered by loss of habitat, so this breeding place is of great value. How soon the tiny stomachs are full all depends on the size of the fish. Moving through the reeds is an art, and to hunt here requires specialist equipment. Good food and a big task will grow feathers on your chest. Total concentration is what it takes. The mother's only chance to feed herself now and then is catching a fish that's too big for her chicks. The open shallows are not for the bitten. Here, the sunfish can feel safe. The males are digging spawning pits. Not easy if your only tool is a tail fin. When an intruder crosses the territory line, battle is inevitable. The females are more relaxed. They can choose from a wide array of spawning pits and among males of all sizes. But only big males have a real chance. This little female has made her choice and welcomes courtship. The waters are swarming with rival males hoping to steal each other's females. The intruder has been seen off. Now the mating can begin. This pile of deadwood is home to another rising generation. To keep her cubs fed, the Martin mother is on her feet day and night. This youngster can hardly wait to accompany his mother on her hunting trips. But the world out there is still a bit risky for such a baby. For days, the Martin mother has been aware of these chicks. But there's no need to panic. As long as they stay in the reed belt, they're safe. The marten has caught the scent of the bird family and is looking for a dry path through the reeds. So near, and yet so far. She must be feeling a bit like these last runners in the island competition. Maybe there's another way to get to the nest. It's always good to see things from a higher vantage point. Far 
too close so I can't breathe There is a place where I can go to To get me some relief Just grab a bag and hear my door slam Leave all the bricks and stones behind I hit the road as fast as I can Embrace the growing smile I sail away back to my tiger has run out of water. This beetle is a diver, but when its pool dries out, it simply takes to the air to find a new one. But not all that glistens is water. On land, the water tiger is slow and clumsy. It's time to get back into his element. That's a lot of air under the little beetle's wings. Some of it will be kept there for breathing when he takes a plunge. There's a sparkle in the distance. Once in the water, the tiger justifies its name. Even the catfish is irritated by the aggressive newcomer. But to further explore the new territory, the water tiger must surface for air. Its powerful hind legs counteract the updrift of its air reserve. After the long flight, a dead sunfish is a good enough meal. But usually the water tiger hunts for live victims, and many of them are twice his size. Dragonflies are reliable indicators of a healthy ecosystem. The eggs of this huge emperor dragonfly are a seal of approval. The water quality is superb. In the eye of a common tree frog, 
Any grass snake is a snake in the grass, especially when it's hunting. The emperor dragonfly is one of the world's fastest flying insects. More of a rocket than a helicopter, it darts after smaller insects. Defending one's airspace can cost more energy than hunting. Short on fuel, the dragonfly is forced to touch down. This is the kind of moment the water frog has been waiting for. As soon as the frog moves, its cover is blown. The grass snake is ready for action. The frog's desperate calls go unheeded. The martin cub is now ready to explore the world. The commotion wakes its curiosity. The snake has already unhinged its jaw to get the frog down. The snake's tail may be a tempting toy, but the snake is not in a toying mood. With the martin's needle-sharp teeth, this game could take a nasty turn. The young martin has only a few weeks to become a hunter. Hunger and its mother will teach it. In the autumn forest, the range of food is changing. But the martin is flexible. Martins are not just hunters, they're also vegetarians. The city kids, too, are doing different things now. Riding the autumn storms, the first winter guests have arrived on the island. Cormorants. In Central Europe, they were almost extinct. Now they're back. For centuries, cormorants were persecuted by fishermen and pond owners because their appetite is legendary. Now cormorants are protected and slowly, populations are recovering. The Danube island seems to offer everything a cormorant might want. For a waterfowl, the cormorant's feathers are unusual. They're not water repellent. When diving, this is a plus. Air can escape from the feathers, so the birds can dive deeper and swim faster. But there's a price to pay. After each dive, cormorants need to dry their wings. Small fish are eaten on the spot. Larger ones take some extra effort. And extra-large fish can almost keep a cormorant from flying.
winter makes the island brittle. Humans have fled the cold. The island is left to wildlife, especially birds. Under the ice, it's a silent world, and life has slowed to a near halt. Ice-free spots are gathering places of sorts. The Danube island has become a popular stopover for long-distance migrants. For fish eaters, this is a rare opportunity in winterly Central Europe. But the ice is tricky. When the reed cobs open up, it's a sure sign that winter is ending. Now the ecologists working on the island get busy. It's the high season for biotope management. With the main channel straightened out, the Danube's flow has lost the power to change its bed and banks. This work is now done by humans to offer the kingfishers ideal conditions for nesting tunnels. The San Martin's embankment also needs renewal, and the vegetation is cut to clear the flight path. The object of such biotope management is to preserve the great diversity of habitats on the island. Humans and animals sharing the island has proved successful. The animals have accepted the human help. Just a few weeks later, a pair of kingfishers begins building their tunnel. Tunneling is dirty work. Kingfishers bathe a lot these days. The motorway along the Danube doesn't seem to bother the birds. Now in spring, the grey herons are also busy building nests. It needn't be a new nest. With a few touches, last year's will do. As soon as the pair is happy with their summer home, they're ready to mate.
from the looks of it, the kingfishers too have completed their tunnel. But with the mallards, things don't go so smoothly. When there's a quarrel, it's often to the advantage of a third party in the background. But the cold water is such a shock. In a pool of the fish ladder by the power station, Sneeps are in an amorous mood. They're on their way to the spawning grounds further up the river. The warm spring weather brings back the people, lots of them. With all the nest building, egg laying and raising of offspring going on, one would expect the presence of humans to be disruptive. But the pendulin tit doesn't seem to mind, as long as the humans just look and don't touch. Well hidden by hedges and copses, deer, brown hare and partridges revel in wildlife pastures that have been kept clear, especially for them. When danger threatens, it's rarely from two-legged visitors, but often from their four-legged companions. rabbits can easily fall victim to the mindlessness of dog owners. The city is moving closer and closer to the island wilderness, but the grey herons stand their ground. Their chicks grow up fast. Within 50 days, they're able to fly. Some of them get impatient long before that. But first, they need to eat a lot more fish. The kingfisher doesn't often eat its catch, and there's a reason. In the tunnel, hungry chicks are waiting. There should be a semblance of discipline to ensure that all are fed, but there's always someone who can't wait for his turn. summer, the bathing season is at its peak. Up to 300,000 people a day come to the island to escape the heat of the city. While bathers and amateur skippers seek pure pleasure, Danube freighters tediously work their way upriver. A high water warning has been broadcast. The boats need to reach a safe haven. Anxiously, skippers listen to the radio. 
Major tributaries in Salzburg have reached the high water mark. In the city of Linz, the floodgates have been opened. From Linz to Vienna, water levels are rapidly rising. In Vienna, the floodgates are still shut. When the water rises further, they'll have to be opened. Then the overflow channel will turn into a raging torrent. Austria has been witnessing a once-in-a-century flood. Along the entire Danube Valley, damage is spreading. Authorities are preparing to evacuate several towns. The flood is still rising. Within one day, the Danube's water level has doubled. Now it's reached the critical mark. The Vienna floodgates are overflowing. The Martin's home could be washed away, but the mother does not realize the danger. To her, it's just another summer rainstorm. A day later, the warnings reach a dramatic pitch. This may grow into the most violent flood in the island's existence. Along the recreation beaches, restaurant owners are alarmed. Whatever can be moved is taken to higher ground. And still the water keeps rising. The floodgates have to be opened. Now half the water masses pour into the new artificial channel. On a normal day, 2,000 cubic meters of water per second flow past Vienna. Now it's five times that amount. Along the new channel, the water level has risen by three meters. The high water situation is stabilizing. Only along the Danube it's still critical. Maximum levels have been reached a few hours ago. Along the entire course of the Danube, vast areas have been flooded. But within the next hours, the waters are expected to recede. Power stations, too, had to open their gates and turn off their turbines. The once-in-a-century flood has left enormous damage across great parts of Europe. But Vienna has been spared. The new channel and the Danube island have passed the ordeal. Apart from a few small bruises. One must be an optimist to fish in this raging current. The fishermen's huts, in any case, remain closed these days. Among the victims, two mice are drifting towards an uncertain fate. The Martin mother has been lucky, very lucky. Disasters can bring unexpected opportunities. Stone Martins absolutely hate getting wet.
Having escaped two disasters in a row, the mice lose no time in starting a new life in a new place. Before the Danube island was built, this was a frequent fate along the river. Gradually, the water level is returning to normal. Now, masses of mud have to be removed as fast as possible, because once the mud dries, it goes hard as concrete. Even after the paths have been cleared, traces of the high water remain. Leaves baked in silt are reminders of the record flood, but they too will be washed clean by the next rain. Nature quickly recovers. Soon there'll be little to hint at the catastrophe. New generations will hatch in the heron's nests, and this year's youngsters will be next year's parents. The playful days are ending, and it's time to seriously learn to fly. The young herons spend days summoning up their courage. Each young heron, when it first soars, will see this unique island glide by underneath. The patchwork of its habitats reflecting the needs of both humans and wild nature. An island of life in the very heart of Vienna.